Welcome back to Chem Exam Explained, where the aim is chemistry clarity exam mastery. In today's video, we will be looking at Cape Chemistry, Module 3, 2019, Chemistry of the Elements. Let's go. 3A. Figure 3 shows the first ionization energies of the period 3 elements, sodium to argon. Part 1. Write the equation including state symbols for the first ionization energy of magnesium. So the first thing we'll do is to write magnesium in the gaseous state to produce magnesium ion with a single charge plus an electron. The magnesium atom must be in the gaseous state and the magnesium ion must also be in the gaseous state. If they require the second ionization energy, then you'll write the magnesium ion with a single positive charge in the gaseous state to form magnesium 2 plus ion, also in the gaseous state, plus an electron. They might ask for a nonmetal like oxygen. Remember that ionization energy is dealing with the removal of electrons. So these examples are showing you the formation for the first and the second ionization energy of oxygen atom. Three part. Two, explain why there is a general increase in the first ionization energies across the period from sodium to argon. Well, the first reason is that there is an increase in the nuclear charge, that is, more protons as you go across the period from sodium to argon. Two, the atoms get smaller, therefore, a stronger force of attraction between the nucleus and the electrons on the outer shell. Part three. Explain why the first ionization energy of magnesium is greater than that of aluminum. In answering the question, we have to look at the configuration and where the last electron is placed. You'll see here that the electrons are placed in the 3S subshell for magnesium, while the last electron is placed in the 3P subshell for aluminum. So, in answering the question, Magnesium has its outer electrons in the 3S subshell, whereas aluminum has its outer electrons in the 3P subshell. The electrons in the 3P subshell is slightly higher in energy than the 3S subshell. Electrons in the 3P subshell are also shielded by the 3S electrons. 3B. The oxides of period 3 elements exhibit variation in their acid base character as evidenced by their reaction with water. Write a balance equation to show the reaction between water and each of the following period three oxides. The first one is sodium oxide with water. So we write Na2O solid plus H2O to produce NaOH. For SO3, which is sulfur trioxide, we write SO3 gas plus H2O liquid to produce H2SO4, which is sulfuric acid. Part C1. Describe an experimental method with expected results to determine the acid base nature of the following three period three chlorides. One, sodium chloride, two, magnesium chloride, and three, silicon tetrachloride. So we will dissolve small amounts of each of the solids in separate beakers with distilled water. We are then going to test the solutions using blue and red litmus paper, or you could use the pH meter to test the pH of the solutions. For sodium chloride, using blue and red litmus paper, we will observe no change in the color since the pH of the sodium chloride solution is neutral. So with the pH meter, you should get a pH of 7. In testing with the blue and red litmus paper for magnesium chloride solution, we are going to experience a color change in the blue litmus paper turning red because the solution is going to be slightly acidic. You'll get no change for the red litmus and the pH meter should give you a reading less than 7 and that could be approximately 6.5. For silicon tetrachloride, we are going to experience a vigorous reaction producing white fumes of HCl. 
when you place the moist blue and red litmus paper in the gas, the blue litmus should change to red because HCl gas is acidic, whereas you'll have no change for a red litmus paper. If you test the solution, you should get a pH of less than seven. This is the equation to produce the HCl fumes. C part two. Write a balanced equation to show the reaction between water and each of the following period three chlorides. Well, in writing the equation, this is a simple version of a more complex equation. So because magnesium chloride is ionic, when it dissolves in water, it will separate into its ions, Mg2 plus and Cl minus. However, this solution is slightly acidic. Now, the reason for that slightly acidic solution is that when you dissolve magnesium chloride in water, you form the complex hexa aqua magnesium two plus ions. Now, this complex will interact with other water molecules to produce this complex where we have a H from one of the water molecules being separated by another water molecules to produce H3O plus. Remember, we had said that H3O plus is equivalent to H plus. So let's look at that quickly. When we have magnesium chloride surrounded by water, it is a small ion with a large charge. So H2O would surround the ion with a negative part of water bonding to the two plus, the positive part of the ion. Another water molecule will come in and then bond to one of the H's on the water. Now this water will pull this H away from the magnesium. Now out of the six of them, it is happening to this one here. And as you can see, once it pulls this away, we now form H3O plus. So this will make our solution now acidic. So we will now form our magnesium with five water around it, so we'll have one, two, three, four, five, and this one will be the sixth one. And this water will pull off this H from this water, leaving magnesium with five water molecules and a OH. So that's what we have here. And the H that was removed would make the solution now acidic. Again, please remember that H3O plus is equivalent to H plus. So both will make our solution acidic. So this would be a slightly acidic solution. Aluminum would be even more acidic because the aluminum ion is even smaller than the magnesium ion with a higher charge, releasing more H plus ions into the water, making it more acidic, giving it a pH of about three. So sodium chloride, would give a pH equal to seven because it is neutral. Magnesium chloride will give a pH of 6.5, making it slightly acidic, while aluminum chloride would give you a pH of three, which is highly acidic. Part D1, define the term transition element. Well, transition metals or transition elements are metals that forms at least one ion with a partially filled D subshell. D part two, list three characteristic properties of transition elements other than forming colored compounds. One, they have high melting point. Two, they are good conductors. Three, their compounds are paramagnetic, which means that they have magnetic properties. Four, they are good catalysts. Five, they show several oxidation states in their compounds. And finally, six, they form complexes with ligands. D part three, a sequence of reactions involving compounds of cobalt with ions A, B, and C is shown below. So you'll see A, B, and C. State the color of the following ions. So here we have our blue tetrahydroxocobaltate two ion. 
and when water is added, we have ligand exchange taking place and will form hexa aqua cobalt 2 plus ions, which is now pink. Another ligand exchange will take place when the ammonia will replace the water, forming a more stable complex, and that will now form hexa amine cobalt 2 ion. I added here that if you leave part C to stand, it will be oxidized to hexa amine cobalt 3 plus ions, which is now dark brown. So when I say leave to stand, air would be the oxidizing agent. But you could use hydrogen peroxide as well to do the job. So the color of B would be pink. The color of C would be light brown. And if you use a peroxide or you leave to stand, it will turn to dark brown. Part four, the electronic configurations of zinc 2 plus and copper 2 plus ions are given below. Account for the fact that unlike copper 2 plus compounds, zinc 2 plus compounds are normally colorless. So we'll say that a transition metal is a metal that forms at least one ion with a partially filled D subshell. That's a definition. So we must know that definition in order to answer the questions properly. So zinc, when it is ionized, does not form an ion with a partially filled D subshell. It loses the 4s2 electrons, leaving the d orbital or the, or the d subshell completely filled. Hence, will be colorless. While copper will lose the 4s1 electron and one of the 3d10 electrons to form 3d9. Now, if you look at 3d9, you'll see that we have a partially filled d orbital. So once we have a partially filled d subshell, it means that this is a transition metal and a property of transition metal because of the variation in the oxidation states, they form colored compounds. So copper two plus ions in solution will be blue while zinc two plus ions in solution will be colorless. This is the end of module three, 2019. Please remember to like, subscribe and click the notification bell so that when new videos are uploaded, you will be notified. Thank you.